Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Carlton Smith of the National Broadcasting Company speaking to you from the American Airlines hangar at Chicago Airport in Chicago. Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, wife of the President of the United States, has just come in. She's standing now at the door of the plane talking to the Postmaster General, and perhaps we can get just a word from her before she walks down the gangplank. She came here with the announced intention of doing anything that Jim Foley wanted her to do. So perhaps while they're standing up here right now, he's telling her just what he wants her to do. Mrs. Roosevelt, we have just a word from you, please. We can't get her eye for just a minute, but now I think we can get it up there. We have just a word, Mrs. Roosevelt. What shall I say? How does this trip compare with the one eight years ago? I had a very, very smooth trip, and I'm very glad to be here. Thank you very much, and that's all we can get now. We didn't get the answer to our question, how this trip compared with the one eight years ago when she came across country, as we recall it, she came across, in any event, we know the president did, in a flight from New York when he came to the Chicago Stadium to accept the nomination of president of the United States. And now we believe that he's going to accept tonight, but in any event, Mrs. Roosevelt is going to appear before the Democratic National Convention tonight and will make a brief address there. She's made a nonstop flight, which she said was very smooth from New York in just a little over four hours. And now she's here at the airport and she starts down the gangplank so we, we can't... They're crying here for more photographs, more photographs, more photographs. Shaking hands with Mr. Farley. Ms. Roosevelt announced that she's coming here to do whatever you wanted her to do. What's that, what's that going to be? Well, Mrs. Roosevelt always does, do, always does the right thing at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's, a, that's the answer from General Farley. I don't know whether you heard our question or not, but it was that Mrs. Roosevelt had come here to do whatever she wanted him to do, and what was that going to be? <clears throat> Mrs. Ro Roosevelt addressed very attractively, all in blue, a small straw blue hat with blue feathers on it, and a long blue coat, and underneath that, a lighter blue dress and also blue shoes. She's going from here to the Stevens Hotel, and then a little later will appear at, Chica at the Chicago Stadium before the members of the Democratic National Convention. And that's all now from the Chicago airport, the American's airline hangar. Ms. Roosevelt came in, as you know, on the American Airlines flagship. We take you now to Tokyo. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tokyo, Japan. We present Newton Edgars of the Japan Advertiser speaking on the Japanese reaction to the renomination of Roosevelt. Mr. Edgars. The Japanese reaction <clears throat> to the renomination of President Roosevelt for a third term, which is also regarded here as virtually assuring his election in November, has not been as great as would ordinarily be the case. Roosevelt's renomination to the Japanese means nothing except in as it may affect the foreign policy of the United States. Roosevelt's foreign policy is naturally taken to be as enunciated on Tuesday by Secretary of State Cordell Hull, and to that there has been plenty of reaction. But Japan is now in the throes of forming a new cabinet, equivalent to a change in presidents in the United States. Naturally, reaction to the American developments is much overshadowed. But such importance is placed on foreign relations that the selection of the new foreign minister by the premier-designate, Prince Konoe, points out the trend. Prince Konoe has selected Mr. Yosuke Matsuoka as his foreign minister. That is one answer to the renomination of President Roosevelt and the continuation of his foreign policies. Mr. Matsuoka is a hard-boiled graduate of the University of Oregon, and he speaks English with a Western Jerkwater College accent, but that is deceiving. He is Japan's reaction to President Roosevelt's renomination as far as American foreign policy is concerned. Mr. Matsuoka may be expected to take pot shots at the Roosevelt foreign policy in as far as it pertains to America's attitude toward the Chiang Kai-shek regime in China, with which Japan has been battling for three years. Foreign Minister Matsuoka is a bristle-haired, table-thumping, militant diplomat, and he will fight Roosevelt's foreign policy if it continues along the lines laid down by Secretary Hull on Tuesday. In this he will have the full backing of Japanese people. 
who have been whipped into a blind following of the aggressive government policies for some time. Remember that it was Mr. Matsuoka who threw a monkey wrench into the deliberations of the League of Nations by getting up in the middle of a session of the Council on the Manchurian Affair and stamping down the aisle to the exit, taking with him the entire Japanese delegation and the Japanese nation out of the League of Nations for good. Roosevelt's policy in the form of the whole statement was bitterly denounced yesterday by the spokesman of the Japanese Navy who said, it is uncalled for intervention in the wrong place. He added that it would not in any way affect Japanese policy. Japan's general reaction to the renomination of President Roosevelt is that, well, it's not so good, but there's nothing we can do about it, and we expected it all along. With hard-boiled Mr. Matsuoka entering the foreign ministry on the heels of President Roosevelt's latest declaration of policy in regard to the Far East, there may be diplomatic fireworks in the near future. So look out, Mr. Roosevelt, for that Japanese boy from the Oregon University. That's the way the Japanese are reacting to the Roosevelt renomination. There's plenty of dynamite in it. Ladies and gentlemen, we return you now to John B. Kennedy in New York. Here we are in the NBC newsroom in New York, butting in just long enough to switch you from Trans-Pacific to Transatlantic to the Eternal City. Go ahead, Rome. Hello, NBC. This is Charles Lanius in Rome. Here in Rome, certain neutral observers believe that Hitler will address the German people and the world at large at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon in Berlin. That, of course, is really today over here, but for you, that is, those of you on the Atlantic seaboard, it will be about 9 o'clock in the morning. Our neutral observers here believe that Hitler's speech will be in the form of an ultimatum to England. And if it is refused, the war on the island will begin. However, there are others who have the opinion that when Hitler speaks, it will be to tell the world that the final attack on Britain has started or will start. Whatever is the case, there is little information in Rome tonight to throw light on this new maneuver. And that's all I'm able to tell you about that report. Well, it seems that what's big news in the United States is considered only small fry over here. At any rate, President Roosevelt's nomination for the third term doesn't get much play in Italy. Tonight's Rome newspapers tuck this news away on their back pages. For instance, the Giornale d'Italia, one of the biggest newspapers, uses three paragraphs about the nomination in his first editions, but then cuts it down to four lines in the final nights. None of the journals have any comment to make. In any case, President Roosevelt's nomination didn't cause much surprise in political circles here. Of course, many Italians are somewhat disappointed. This is natural in view of the president's pro-English attitude. These fascists believe that his policy will continue to be one of giving non-belligerent aid to England if he is elected for the third term. It's pointed out that Italy gave the same kind of aid to Germany before she finally ended the war. It's even possible that should the war last long enough, the United States under Roosevelt might get get in it on the side of England, these observers believe. On the other hand, some observers remark that a third term for Roosevelt clearly shows that any government head must have power for a long time in order to successfully complete social problems. Now, the Turin newspaper, La Stampa, which has the second largest circulation in Italy, today forecast that at the conclusion of the war, all Jews will be run out of Europe. La Stampa suggests the island of Madagascar in the Indian Indian Ocean is the most likely place to send them. The Jews should be sent as far away as possible and in conditions which would be most unfavorable for their return. After war, Europe will be... Uh, reborn in the great nationalist conception of Italy and Germany. Uh, This is Charles Lanius in Rome. I now return you to NBC in New York. We've heard from Tokyo and Rome, ladies and and gentlemen. Now we'll try to contact the NBC representative in France, Paul Archinard. Until Paris fell, Mr. Archinard was heard frequently from the then French capital. Later, we heard him from Bordeaux and then from Tours. Now Vichy is the seat of the French government. Vichy, so long associated with a drink and now with a disaster. So to Vichy, we now turn. Go ahead, please, Mr. Archinard. Hello, NBC. This is Paul Archinard, speaking from Vichy in France. This is the first broadcast from Vichy, the first broadcast to America from unoccupied France since the armistice. Now, the armistice was signed only a little more than three short weeks ago, but it all seems much farther away to me. So many things have happened in that time. We have seen so many towns and places since that date. We have witnessed so much unhappiness on the roads of southern France 
where 10 million refugees are waiting to return to their homes, stranded in country villages for lack of gasoline or transportation, or for lack of funds, or again immobilized by governmental orders which ban aimless wanderings from one locality to another, wanderings which disorganized relief work and traffic and the transport of supplies. In many towns, lodgings were unavailable at any price. Whole families slept in trucks, in automobiles, or in their farm carts. In other places, it was difficult to find food, even in restaurants, which could no longer cope with the demand of everybody. Quite obviously, life is not normal in France today. It won't be normal until millions of people have returned to their homes, until millions of men have been demobilized and are back on the job. But for the last ten days at least, all outward signs of normal life have reappeared. Due to stringent governmental orders, there are no longer thousands of homeless nomads trekking over the roads of France. People have managed to find lodgings in little wayside farms or in tiny city tenements, but they live on their savings, just like the rest of France is living on its reserves today. Still, there is no severe shortage of anything just now, though potatoes are scarce and butter is at a premium, and soap is getting scarce too. However, people are thinking of winter. They are thinking that cool weather is only a few weeks away and that certain hardships which are bearable during the balmy summer months become real hardships when winter comes around. And the French government is very much preoccupied with these problems. Farmers are the first to be demobilized. Efforts are being made to bring living conditions back to normal in the unoccupied territories by re-establishing railway facilities and postal facilities and joining Fam members of families which have been, who have been separated by encouraging refugees to return to their homes as soon as possible. And that is the reason the government is particularly anxious to return to Paris or to Versailles so that the whole of France may feel it is being administrated by the central government so that the many departments of the civil services can return to their usual place of work and not try to carry on the internal affairs of a country from the cramped quarters of a hotel room. So Vichy, for the time being, is the seat of the French government. But it was to Clermont-Ferrand, about 40 miles away, that the government went first after leaving Bordeaux. Clermont-Ferrand, as capital of ancient Gaul, the old city where the first crusade was preached nine centuries ago, seemed entitled to this distinction. But Clermont-Ferrand is an industrial city first and foremost. It wasn't possible to lodge the many departments of the government there. Vichy, with its many hotels, was more convenient. Now, all the principal hotels and many of the lesser ones have been requisitioned for governmental services. Sentries stand in front of doors where footmen used to open carriage doors. Typewriters click in the halls. Uh, and uh, our well, studio is in a small room of the city's largest hotel right near the American Embassy, where it has just moved in. A few minutes ago, I passed along the silent halls, past Pierre Laval's private suite. Up to three days ago, Marshal Pétain also lived under the same roof where our studio is, one floor below, only one story above the street, where all day long people stand in line waiting to catch a glimpse of the old marshal and to cheer him. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>